Uh, welcome to the 2018 uh, commemoration. Lots of familiar faces, which is great to see. Lots of new faces, which is also great to see. I'd like to welcome Todd Fernando, a previous recipient of the Mount Cameron Scholarship. I'd like to congratulate um, Bindi Vice, even though she's not here today, who's recently won the Carolyn Jones uh, ABC Journalism Scholarship. And uh, it's all her hard work, but it's great to have been involved in it. I'd also like to uh, welcome Mark Davis here as the previous uh, orator. And all of you. So as, as we progress into the 21st century, the 20th century political relativities of left and right, communist and fascist, have become confusing and less and less relevant. Indeed, after such a ridiculous week in Australian political life, we end up with a Prime Minister who laughingly tossed a lump of coal in our parliament, who was the architect of our current immigration policy, which I'm sure Tim will tell us more about, and all the lies that have followed. And so we're constantly reminded that the road to a better world is still long and challenging. Through all of this, I've been reading The Long Walk to Freedom by Nelson Mandela. Throughout the book, in every page, in every debate, throughout the years he didn't mind on Northern Ireland, the months and years of solitary confinement, his commitment to peace, <coughs> to inclusiveness, to the value of the debate of ideas and to the inspira aspirational idea of humanity, to which I believe we all should aspire or some way. He believed in a better, less selfish future and the importance of education as the mechanism for achieving this. Mandela was an optimist. At a point in the book, I also realised that I was reading the history of the ideas and aspirations that inspired and informed my parents' philosophies. So much about the root of their philosophical life became clear as Mandela chronologically described the political history of South Africa. The late 1940s and 50s were now at university handing out papers and townships, debating ideas with friends and family, the time of their wedding, of Larry's birth, the Chapel riots, the start of a sabotage campaign, my birth, hiding friends of theirs from the police, their friends being arrested, our immigration to Australia, their political involvement in Australia, and then how deeply they felt, how deeply their excitement at Mandela's release. In all of this, I've come to believe that the left-right relativities continue, but not as we knew them. Rather, they've evolved in the 21st century to the relativities of optimism versus fear. The politics that we used to call left wing is now being replaced by the politics of optimism that humanity can become better. While what we used to call right wing now demands that we be fearful, selfish, and pessimistic about the future. The Renata Kamala Scholarship is an optimistic scholarship, seeking to redress in its own small way some of the imbalances of Australian history and in the importance of education to achieve this. And through, through this, that the world will become a better place. So on this note, I'd like to welcome Pat Mercer, this year's recipient, to say a few words and to be welcome. Woman Jenka, welcome. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the owners of the country in which we uh, are gathered, the Wurundjeri of the Kulin Nation. I acknowledge and appreciate their warmth, generosity and hospitality in welcoming us here in college, come to their country and so that we may gather to work and learn. I acknowledge their sovereignty, country and culture was forcibly stolen and never willingly ceded. That the planting of the Union Jack did not nullify a millennia of complex, vibrant society. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and future and also extend my respects to any Indigenous people here today. My name is Patrick Mercer, and I'm a Wadarung man from the Central Highlands region of Victoria. I'm graduating a Bachelor of Arts this year, majoring in Ancient World Studies, and minoring in Indigenous Studies. <coughs> I'd like to thank the Cameron family for inviting me back to speak again this year, and for their continued commitment to Ormond's Indigenous program, and their efforts more broadly in closing the gap in Indigenous education. We're lucky this year to have Tim Costello to speak to something very pertinent, timely, and apt. Something that, as a young person, about on the cusp of entering the wide world, has filled me with a cocktail of fear and hope. 
Before I discuss the question of how can we live together and what that means to me as an Indigenous person in Australia, I'll touch on why we're here and why the Renata Kamina Scholarship exists. I grew up poor. I grew up watching my parents struggle to give their kids, my six siblings and I, the opportunities that they deserve, that we deserve. It is their efforts that sent me and my siblings to some of the best schools in the country. I watched them fight to give their kids a better life, to keep a roof over our heads and food on our tables. I watched them say battle with unemployment, mental illness, and living below the poverty line, all the while making sure their kids never missed any opportunities. No matter how tight money was, they could always scrape together a tenant that we needed for school excursions, always make sure we had a good breakfast, and that we got our homework done. I would travel for five hours a day to get to and from school. My parents made me realise that I could do and be so much more, pushing me to apply for a bursary at St Ignatius Review in Sydney. With these new horizons, the expectations and possibilities of a prestigious boarding school in Sydney was a far cry from anything I'd experienced beforehand. From there, the possibility of attending university, the best university in the country, was certainly possible. And as far as I was concerned, an inevitable future. Education, to me, is the single great equaliser. It transcends class, gender, wealth, race, disability. With a good education, in a single generation, sons and daughters live lives of access and comfort unimaginable to their parents. Of all the bipartisan national efforts towards closing the gap, the only markers showing significant success are Year 12 completion and tertiary education attendance. It is thanks to the efforts of institutions such as Ormond College and the University of Melbourne, and the generous philanthropists such as the Cabinet family, um, that these targets have been achieved. A good education is, above all, an opportunity to better oneself in a way money can't buy. Once upon a time, not so long ago, being Indigenous was a life sentence. <coughs> Today we speak of Indigenous excellence, of Indigenous students taking the opportunities that come their way to achieve truly remarkable things, by any measure of success, on their own terms. <coughs> For those interested in the business case of programs such as the Cabinet Scholarship, or any other equity, equity programs in our nation's institutions, consider this. A person with a good education is more likely to get a decent job. A person with a decent job is more likely to have a better mental and physical health outcome. A person with a decent job is more able to take care of their families, both their elders and, and children. Good health standards, sorry, good health and standards of living are the foundations of strong communities. Strong communities are healthier, better educated, sorry, strong communities are healthier, better educated people require less interventions, less emergency health services, less welfare dependency, less police and policing and justice system intervention. To raise Indigenous Australians out of third world standards of poverty through education is a national challenge, but it is also an opportunity for our nation's defining moment. As someone who has crossed the thresholds of socioeconomic class, I know what it can feel like to be different, to feel at odds with your community, at times feeling that you cannot understand the experience of your friends and peers, and vice versa. As an Indigenous person not born into the same privileges as many of my peers, I have firsthand understood, understood the challenges of living together. In 1988, Bob Hawke promised a treaty with the nation's first peoples at the Barama Festival. In 1992, Paul Keating developed, delivered the Red Fern speech, an unabashed, <coughs> uncompromising acknowledgement of the ravages of invasion and colonial power structures upon Indigenous Australians. The Howard years marked the coming of the post-self-determination era. This was followed by Kevin Rudd's 2008 apology, a sentiment muddied by Labor's commitment to the damaging paternalism of the Northern Territory intervention embarked upon by Howard. I list these events for they display the acute importance of listening in Indigenous affairs. Barunga, the Red Fern speech, the self-determination period, <coughs> the apology. These events stand out in Australian history because unlike the overwhelming span of our nation's history, they signify moments where governments listen to the experiences, the needs, the desires of the Indigenous community and acted upon them, both symbolically and in dollar terms. <coughs> The Howard years, defined by so-called practical reconciliation, such as intervention, offers striking learnings of how not 
listening to the needs and wishes of Indigenous communities not only damages these communities, but also becomes a budgetary black hole from which progress seldom escapes. We now, I believe, live in a post-statement period, the Makaratha period. For those who have not read the 2017 Uluru Statement from the Heart, I urge you to go and do so. This marks the moment that the absolute, unanimous voice of Indigenous Australia has offered in no uncertain terms their wishes, hopes and needs for the future, which in an instant was shamefully dismissed by then, at the time of writing this, current Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. <laughs> I, sorry, I acknowledge that in the striking lack of federal leadership, state and council, state and council governments are answering this call. The current government, Victorian government, has passed into legislation a commitment to recognising Indigenous sovereignty through treaty. The South Australian and Northern Territory governments are currently engaged, engaged in the same process. City councils such as those in Moreland, Hobart and Fremantle are taking steps to acknowledge our painful history and that the 26th of January is not for all Australians a happy occasion. So where to from here? How can Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians live together? Reconciliation must come from a basis of mutual goodwill, respect and empathy. Indigenous voices must be heard. You all play a part in this, whether it is by donating and attending events and causes such as the Renata Kamen Scholarship, by writing to your local member, by considering the role your business plays in the pursuit of reconciliation, by considering thoughtfully who you will elect in the next election. Read our history. The history you and I were taught was not based on truth, but rather is written by those with deaf ears and blinders on, pensively considering the Aboriginal problem while looking past the Aboriginals themselves. I urge you all to listen to us for all our sakes. Thank you. Wow, um, it's with enormous pride that um, I listen to that, Pat, um, and it's fabulous to have you here, also Todd, um, past, um, back there, past scholarship recipient, and I mean, it's, it's, as you can imagine, it's tremendous pride that the American uh, uh, oration has led to these scholarships from numbers of people, as I mentioned, Betty Bryce, one of the previous recipients, Ruth, recently getting a prestigious award. I remember when she was here and spoke and said that her ambition was to be a journalist. I think I was thought, hmm, journalism is not, not the best profession to get in the nowadays. But she went on, she believed in it, she went to the ABC and now she's um, recently won an uh, award, a uh, journalist award with them. So that is absolutely fantastic. Um, great to have Mark here. I do want to acknowledge one of our other uh, past relation here, Mr. Lynn Davis, in the, in the second row. So it's great to have two. Um, past uh, givers of the Renata commemoration. But today, I'm, you know, I think we're all thrilled to have uh, the Reverend Tim Costello uh, speak to us on an incredibly topical theme. And I'll leave Tim to uh, speak more about that. Some, some bio notes on Tim. Um, 30 years CEO of um, World Vision Australia up until 2016. Currently, is World Vision Australia's chief advocate um, and continues to place global poverty on the national agenda. He's chair of the Community Council of Australia, member of the SBS Community Advisory Committee, chief advocate of the Thriving uh, Communities Partnership, board member of the Campaign for Australian Aid, founding board member of the Alliance uh, for Gambling Reform. His past roles have included national president of the Baptist Union of Australia and also the mayor of St Kilda. Uh, he studied law and education in Monash, and the by theology at the International Baptist Seminary in Switzerland. He's a Baptist minister at the St Kilda uh, and Common Street Baptist Church. Uh, he's won numerous uh, honours. In 2006, he was Victoria's Australian of the Year. 2005, he was the he was awarded the uh, uh, Office of the Order of Australia. 2004, he was uh, Victorian. Yeah. And in 1997, he was named as one of Australia's 100 national living treasures. Tim, we're enormously honoured to have you here today. We look forward to you. Traditional owners and the custodians of the land, the Wurundjeri and the Kulin Nation, I want to acknowledge the Dean. Just two weeks of Ormond, uh, Lara McKay, isn't it? Yeah, so lovely to be here. 
<coughs> at Ormond. Um, for some reason, I always have a, a flashback when I come to one of the colleges. Uh, some years back, I was asked to uh, deliver a lecture for Queen's in honour of the founder, and they said to me, this is serious. You're coming to rescue the whole lecture series. It's been going 150 years. And I said, why? I said, oh, to... Oh, this is on tape. I shouldn't be telling this story. <laughs> <laughs> Two years ago, we had read uh, Simon's, uh, an old boy of Queen's. He was so drunk, it was a fiasco. Uh, we had Malcolm Fraser. He was so boring, they all walked out. You're here to rescue it. So I felt a great weight on my shoulders and uh, did my best. And afterwards, they were really ecstatic. And uh, I'll never forget two young, buxomous, beautiful students grabbed me in either arm, and they said, that was fantastic. We're taking you to the after party, and we're getting you totally drunk. <laughs> All I had in my mind was the first stone, an ornament. <laughs> I said, thank you. I think I'll just go home to my wife. <laughs> Anyway, thanks for the flashback. Um, it's uh, it's uh, really an honour to deliver an oration in memory of a remarkable woman who, by example, taught us that it's possible for people to live together. Renata was dedicated to social justice and talked much of the dignity of all people. She had faith that there could be a better world for our children, which these scholarships absolutely represent, and she worked hard to achieve it. I don't know what Renata would have made of the last week in politics. I flew up there, uh, Mark, on Wednesday because I had a scheduled meeting with Peter Dutton. <laughs> and on Tuesday morning, he said, no, the meeting's still on. Uh, events overrun it. Uh, us. I had a scheduled meeting because since my visit to Manus just before Christmas I've been going back and going back and saying we cannot continue to justify what I saw, we have to, to act. Well, whatever we make of the events of the last uh, week, I still believe we can live together and it is our duty to remain positive and optimistic just like Renata was. Well, someone on Earth is a child, probably born quite recently, who could be alive 150 years from now. This child most likely will be female, and you do wonder, what will you do with a life of 150 years? We uh, know that much more important to us humans than happiness is actually meaning to have a point to it all. Nietzsche famously said, the person who has a why, meaning, can live with any how. Well, when you think of long lives, you say, would this child spend more time climbing a corporate ladder, take more holidays, plan a longer retirement? Could be a very long retirement. <laughs> Make grand long-term plans, love better, hope more. Geneticists believe half of those who born this year will live to longer than 100 years. By the end of the century, life expectancy in Western nations could be 150 to 200 years. But what about the people I represent in World Vision? From East Timor and Papua New Guinea, as we know, the Tiwi Islands, part of Australia, literally you can walk to Papua New Guinea from them, so close, and yet, Born here, universal health, universal education, clean water. Just an hour's flight to East Timor, or even walking distance to Papua New Guinea, you drew the last lottery in the ticket of life. We so blessed. Maybe going to live to 100 of our kids and grandkids to be 150. Well, it does raise questions. Would doubling our lifespan make that much difference spiritually, ethically? Personally, what would we do? Would we choose to love more, to give more? Would we become more spiritual or more ethical? I suspect probably not. It seems to me that no matter how much time humans have, we remain essentially the same. 
Morally, I suspect we're no better or worse than those born a century ago. So, what does the future actually hold? The satire, as John Sladek said, the future will be exactly like the past, only far more expensive. <laughs> there is a thought-provoking quote by Jonah Salk who said, if all the insects were to just disappear from the earth within 50 years, all life on earth would end. If all the humans disappeared from earth within 50 years, all other forms of life would flourish. It's quite telling, isn't it? Well, to survive, to have meaning, not just happiness, that's a byproduct, I think, of meaning, we need to work together and live together. For thousands of years, the people who lived along China's Yellow River were known as the cradle of Chinese civilization. But they were members of very diverse tribes. The tribes didn't communicate with each other. When devastating floods and droughts came, these independent tribes could do little to alleviate the suffering because each tribe controlled just a small part of the Yellow River. Over time, in the third century BC, uh, the BCE, the tribes came together to form the United Chinese Tribe, not nation, but a bigger entity. Together, they built canals and dams along the Yellow River. Unifying, they solved a common problem and extended their prosperity and their lifespan. Prosperity was raised for everyone. Now, we know so many countless examples of this sort of cooperation when we choose to live together all around the world. But right at the moment, and it was suggested in the introduction, we have a nationalism narrative versus a globalisation narrative. For many centuries, nationalism and patriotism worked quite well. Wars aside, patriotism was a natural affection for our home, it gave us ability to care about each other and to come together in collective action. Belonging is fundamentally important to caring and to learning ethics. If you don't feel you belong, you don't actually care and you don't practice ethics. Patriotism was a fondness for place, but it didn't say my place is better than your place and I'm imposing my way of life on you it was more defensive. Well, when we were living tribally, um, the most important issues we faced, uh, we could come together out of patriotic concern and cooperate. Now, of course, the most important issues we face are global. And neither patriotism or nationalism, and nationalism is more about prestige and winning, over and against others is really quite hopeless to deal with global challenges. We see this in national politics. It may even spell some of the reason for the spinning in the Prime Ministership. Political leaders say, vote for us. I'll pull the right levers. I'll bring about the change you need. But in part, it's deception. The national levers alone aren't significant enough to pull. We actually have to work multilaterally, cooperate with a common vision to address the global challenges we've got. So, many political leaders find they've sold hope, and as you know, the trick in life is managing expectations. If they're too low, you don't stretch yourself. If they're too high, you crush people and they're disillusioned, and they don't ever trust you again. Saying, as a leader, I can solve the problems when it's just a national leader. Well, climate change, international trade rules, rapid economic transformations, global poverty, can only be solved through global cooperation. I'm not arguing for global government, but I certainly am arguing for global governance. The sense that we actually have to find a way to address these global problems. We know the world is a waterbed. You press down in one place, it comes up in another. We simply can't pull up the drawbridge 
and say, nationally, we'll just solve the problem. Well, to be rapidly nationalist in the 21st century, that competitive prestige, really means you are denying the global problems, the real problems that exist. And that's, I fear, what we see happening as part of civil society, the C20 outreach group at the G20. I've gone to uh, the last four or five G20s. In Hamburg last year, I watched Putin We'll make Mother Russia great again. <laughs> and uh, Thor Erdogan, who flitted in, and the humiliation of the Ottoman Empire when they had the caliphate. And that resurging hope he has sold, but now with virtually dictatorial powers. And of course, uh, there was a man with uh, a rather bad haircut saying, we're going to make America great again. It struck me you would never hear a German chancellor say, we're going to make Germany great again. <laughs> Everyone would know whose voice they were hearing, right? We know where that leads. Now, President Trump, as a campaigner, was brilliant picking up the pain. The Rust Belt, the middle class feeling they're going backwards. Extraordinary electoral radar. But what did he do with the pain? He said to those people in pain, and I'll tell you why you're in pain. It's because of Mexicans we're going to build a wall. It's Muslims we're going to ban them. It's blacks, it's the Chinese who have humiliated us with their trade surplus and currency manipulation. We know in history that when you connect people's pain to scapegoats, this is ugly. This is scary. It might serve nationalism. But we know where that story ends. Well, many, many societies are feeling a deep sense of cultural insecurity. Politics has become sectarian and polarised. We know uh, identity politics is politics based on race, religion, social class. Uh, <coughs> forming political alliances on those foundations that break away from broad-based parties with common principles. We know that this is really worrying. And certainly the external forces, migration being blamed on the erosion of traditional values. Of course, the great tragedy in all of this is that the biggest losers of blinkered nationalism are often the poorest people those who are most vulnerable. But it seems with authoritarian populist leaders, the answer of retribalizing makes sense to them. Well, I think sadly we're seeing in the 21st century the old sentiments, maybe old gods of blood and soil coming back. These gods never went away. The old gods of blood and racial purity, profound racism, and we know where they lead, of soil and national purity, we know that leads to nationalism, which gives us potentially world wars. The retribalization and the turning inwards, that wind is a gale, and it is blowing. And it's made comfortable conditions for leaders who exhibit racism xenophobia to take strongholds of leadership and policy making. Our own leaders in Australia keep telling us we're a generous nation. Yet according to the OECD's global rank ranking, we've fallen from 17th just last year to 19th this year in giving of foreign aid. Yet we're the third largest OECD economy, giving proportionally far less than nations not nearly as wealthy. Ireland, Belgium, New Zealand, way behind Britons and Scandinavian nations. But we're always told we're generous. There's always money for military, hard power, you need defence forces, but soft power, aid, always is getting cut, now to its lowest level. It comes as a surprise when I tell members of coalition that aid was at its highest under Bob Menzies, 0.51%. That surprises them. I say aid should be bipartisan. 
we, you have been really profoundly dropping the ball here if we're going to be dealing with refugee crises and climate change and global problems. We actually have to be generous and stepping up. Well, the retribalizing is quite worrying. We see it with in the zeitgeist. Head in the sand authoritarian leaders, you may not agree with me, but my list includes Donald Trump, Hun Sen, Benjamin Netanyahu, Rodrigo Duterte, certainly Vladimir Putin and uh, Recep Erdogan. I uh, had an hour and a half with Putin in his dasher outside Moscow. It was quite a fascinating encounter. We talked Syria, we talked why he was closing down any charity uh, under the Russian Foreign Agents Act that took a dollar from outside uh, Russia. He said that's them playing politics. I've been well briefed. In, I said in Russian you have one word for policy and politics. Civil society and charities, even if they take dollars from outside or have people from outside, are not foreign agents. They're not playing politics. They will always speak up about policy. Putin agreed, and this whole press conference was televised, so I saw my comments on TV in Moscow and read them in the English-speaking papers. He agreed. Okay, I'll change the foreign agents law, he said. I was a hero for a short time in Russia in the charity section. When I saw him at the G20 in Brisbane, he said, oh no, the Duma wouldn't agree with the change. Yeah, right. Um, it was fascinating that he was interested that I had reverend before my name. He told me, I'm telling young Russians to go back to church. He said, you know, there's a hollowness and they need something. I thought, interesting from an ex-KGB man. <laughs> uh, and I said, well, that's good. And then I uh, raised with him pussy right. I said, um, I know they offended the uh, Russian Orthodox Patriarchy and the Hierarchy singing in St. Saviour's there in Moscow. But as a church, surely they would have said, don't send them to Siberia. As a church, the gospel teaches us to forgive. A look of utter incomprehensibility came across Putin's face. And he said, why would a church ever say that? I realised the Russian church is just the department of the state. He gives them billions of rubles to rebuild their churches. They return the favour, the patriarch says. Putin's God's man and his actions of war in Syria are a holy war. That's what the patriarch said. Well, these are the old gods. And they're disturbing. But there is a reactionary emotion, a nostalgia. Uh, whiplash to globalisation and the sense that a cosmopolitan elite have had the benefits of it and local loyalties and tribes who have missed out. I understand that. But given our problems are global, a retrograde vision saying let's make America a great again, rather than French President Macron's Recycle Trump's slogan, let's make the planet great again, isn't, isn't the answer if it's nationalist. Well, I see us subdividing our world, even as it gets larger and global, because we're desperate for a place to belong. Left and right don't really make sense anymore. They've been, I suspect, replaced by the real divide, national and global. We have to dig deeper into this. Tribalism is hardwired and pervasive. Our opinions, emotions, loyalties, customs, perceptions of right and wrong, good and evil, are shaped by the group that we belong to, as is our willingness to hate rival groups. As humans, we do need to belong. We do need a tribe who will be there for us, who will laugh at our jokes. In Zurich, where I studied for four years, uh, I found in a cross-cultural setting, there's no such thing as cross-cultural humour. Uh, that's tribal. That actually gives you a sense of place. 
I just finished writing my memoirs and sent them off and uh, I realised as I started writing them that my story started way before I was born, that I had been there even though I wasn't alive. That what had shaped me in my parents and grandparents' story was profoundly influential in who I am today. This sense of belonging and tribe is really important. What we're seeing in the questions are who are my people? Who do I connect to? How does that nourish me and overcome isolation? Where is the place where I can be safe and understood? We mustn't dismiss how profoundly important it is to have give answers like that. But in giving answers, and this is the great philosophical debates, it's always the tension between the universal and the particular, between sameness, we're all the same, and difference. The uh, tension between inclusivity and where do we draw our lines because if we're so open, we don't actually belong anymore. At the St Kilda Church, the motto I came up with where I started my ministry was committed at the core, open at the edges. We do need a core. We need a sense that we've planted our feet on solid ground and know our story. A story that began, as I said, before I was born. But in a global world, we have to actually be radically open. No matter where, when and how, people have the right to exist within tribes, but we have to help them understand they belong to larger tribes, region, state, country, cause and planet that are bigger. And tribes must never get into the superiority, inferiority thing. That's why I love Martin Luther King. You know, when he was assassinated in Memphis, he was going to march the next day for white rubbish, trash work that it's all for. And his civil rights uh, advisors said, not our fight, those whites are rednecks. We're fighting for black civil rights. And Martin Luther King said, yeah, you're right, they are rednecks, they are racists, but remember, they have been told by white elites, you might be white trash, but remember this, at least you're not black. This need to be superior over someone else, Martin Luther King was abolishing, whilst still belonging to the black tribe. Well, aggressive nationalism will lead to very dark places. In the 1940s, George Orwell argued that nationalism causes people to disregard common sense, to become more ignorant toward facts. All was said his definition of nationalism is not the same as what he and most people mean by patriotism. Patriotism is of its nature defensive. Nationalism, on the other hand, is aggressive, inseparable from the desire for power. Orwell gives the name nationalism to the propensity of identifying oneself with a single nation or other unit, placing it beyond good and evil and recognising no other duty than that of advancing its interests. And we beat this drum, how glorious it is to die for the nation. Well, was the nation's cause right and just? Is the sacrifice indeed glorious? All argue that obsessive nationalism not only does not disapprove of atrocities committed by its own side, it has a remarkable capacity for not even hearing about those atrocities. There is a shadow side. In the Vietnam War, General William Westmoreland, commander of the US forces, commented, Asians are not like us. Therefore, he could wage war on them. The general said Asians didn't mind dying. They didn't have the same respect for life as Westerners. He divided the world into us and them. Body counts became the measure of success even though they were losing the war. Kill more, kill more. That must be successful. Well, it's tribalism 
at its worst. Genocide, wars, hovering up for certain institutions, child abuse, as churches and other institutions have done, tried first, rather than rights first. Professor of History and Theology Howard Snyder once asked an interesting question. How would one go about intentionally undermining community, isolating people from one another and from a shared life? First, he said, you have to fragment family life, then move people away from the neighbourhoods in which they grew up in, rather than allow them to live near relatives and friends and among familiar landmarks. Then separate the places people work from where they live, divide their lives into as many worlds as possible, and gradually move people farther and farther apart through ever larger backyards, bigger houses, walls, fences and apartments. Then they'll just fill their houses with things that distract. Part of globalisation's downside, of course, is you've got to go where the jobs are. You've got to tear up local communities. You've got to be mobile. And traditions and loyalties and attachments also get torn up. We have to acknowledge the shadow side of this because as humans, we need a story that's local. Much has been said, including this week, about how social media fuels tribalism. We uh, know that it's more than just a distraction because now, thanks to the CEO of Cambridge Analytica, we know that it's a manipulated distraction. I was quite struck and sting by the BBC on the CEO of Cambridge Analytica. He said, humans are only driven by two things, hope or fear. Don't worry about facts, he said, we just make those up. We, with our micro-programming, know more about them than they know about themselves. All their Facebook likes and others mean. We know more about them than their partners know about them. It's a really a definition of God and omnipotence, isn't it? Om omniscience. We will micro under the radar target them with messages of fear or hope. Well, in a micro retribalizing world without uh, main stream broadcasting, it's a world where people only consume the news and views they agree with. They're in a bubble. Prepackaged on Facebook and other so uh, social media. And this transformation has been so swift. Social media users in Australia, uh, some of the most prolific in the world, a total of around 60% of our population are active users on Facebook. Facebook, 50% of the nation logging in at least once a day, spending five hours, 35 minutes daily on the internet. So the real danger is not hacking into our emails or bank details, but hacking into our feelings, feelings of fear or hate, maybe feelings of vanity reinforced in the bubble with the algorithms driving our prejudices to our, our chosen echo chamber. US technology guru and author Tom Mann preaches the need to reconnect technological capabilities with moral responsibilities. Mann said recently, technology has satisfied one numerical wish for material riches. It's provided little foundation for me, but true living. Man argued for a more lasting foundation. He appreciated the wisdom of the ancients in setting up a Sabbath, simply to suggest that for one seventh of the week, you pull back from the grind of daily life, even social media, you reconnect with your family, you ponder transcendent issues such as the meaning of life. You slow down. You invest in relationship. He says the problems of disconnection are not really about technology. They're about us. And we need to make some decisions. We need to find their identities against encroaching forces of globalisation. Terrain argued the twin processes of globalisation and particularisation are pushing us further and further apart. 
On one hand, traditional values and forms of cultural expressions are being eroded by a homogenized mass culture. On the other, communities are becoming more introverted as they fight to defend themselves from outside influences. He says the answer would seem to be a more humane, better regulated, and more democratically responsive form of globalization. I'll spare you the details of how he sets up the architecture for that. There have been many thinking about the rise of artificial intelligence. Uh, Alan, Alan Finkel has been writing some remarkable things about this. And really, it is with its rise a sense and technology and capitalism provide meaningful work for us. Will we be blocked from being creative? Will we suffer profound alienation? Marx's critique of capitalism was alienation. He called it species essence. That we are made to be creative and now we're just cogs in a wheel. We're not being craftsmen and poets. We're not making our own clothes. And we are alienated. He, of course, criticised capitalism as, though he thought it was brilliant, Marx thought it was more brilliant than Roman and Egyptian empires because it created so many goods. And in the communist world, you needed it to redistribute those goods. And he said, it's like a monster outside ourselves. Even the, even the good employer businessman, if he pays fair wages and lowers working hours, will go broke because the monster outside will have other competitors moving into the market. It is beyond any one of us, even if acting ethically. Well, artificial intelligence is raising a different question. Uh, suffering alienation, are we going to be able to find meaning just in work? robotization and AI. Are we going to need to only work 20 hours a week and learn to trim roses, play music, write poetry to nourish our souls? Retailing analyst Victor Laval declared as long ago as 1955 that productive economies demand that we make consumption our way of life, that we convert the buying and use of goods into rituals, that we seek our spiritual satisfaction and ego gratification and consumption. I often notice this. You go into uh, shopping emporiums and they're built with arches like ancient temples. And there's music playing and soothing. And you've had the message of, well, let's call it sin, preach. There's something missing in your life. But sin is you failed. You know there's something missing in your life. And you go up. Oh, buy something from the counter, and I might as well not be a shop assistant, but a, uh, a priest. They say, try on. Oh, you look fantastic in that. Taste, handle, it's like the sacrament. And you hand over your money, just like you do in church, <laughs> a usual benediction, have a nice day. And you walk out with the feeling of salvation. I've found what's missing in my life. There is this interesting interplay going on in our culture. Is consumerism the modern theology? If it is, then social morality has to be the counterbalance to self-interest. It's interesting uh, when you look at some experiments that have been done with guaranteed basic in income systems, saying give people a certain amount of money because they're not going to have secure jobs. And in 1974, all residents on the town Dauphin in Canada were guaranteed a, gay, a basic income. That ensured that no one fell below the poverty line. The experiment continued for a number of years. It was heralded a success. Many people didn't quit their jobs, they just found their jobs more satisfying. Data collected showed that in the town there were lots of positive effects. Improved school results for kids for children, reduction in mental illness and domestic violence, bills were paid, 
and there was food on the table. A universal basic income, people are working less hours. It was claimed that poverty in, in, in Canada was eliminated for the five years the experiment ran. Are we going to be having to explore in a globalised world basic income experiments? John Quiggan, Professor of Economics at the University of Queensland last year described the implementation of universal basic income in Australia as challenging but possible. He said the cost it's between 5 to 10 percent of GDP. But with robotization and insecure work and AI, we're going to have to think differently about meaning and work. Well, Pope Francis recently <coughs> said, the only future worth building includes everyone. I agree with Pope, uh, Pope Francis that the growth of scientific and technological innovation, wonderful, must come along with more equality and more social inclusion. With that old word, solidarity, a beautiful word to remind us of the dignity of every human. Our planet is full of challenges, debilitating poverty, child slavery, injustice, disease, if we feel the need to solve problems that really exist in the world, why should we not need to give our hearts and minds to a greater cause? A spiritual imagination, maybe deeper than psychology, philosophy, politics or physics, that cuts straight to the heart of our existence. That sense of empathy with others. I uh, was in Bidi Bidi, northern Uganda, just a few months ago. A million South Sudanese have crossed the border because of the tribal violence. And World Vision's there, housing, feeding, setting up shelters, something like 40,000 unaccompanied kids who will put a white armband on. Their parents have, in South Sudan have said, just follow the column of suffering humanity, walking to Uganda. Kids arrive disoriented, walking for four or five days, we don't know if their parents are alive or dead, we find them foster families. But what really amazed me is Uganda has not closed its borders. Uganda gives each one of those uh, South Sudanese families 30 by 30 metres land. Pretty scrubby land, but land. We then give them the materials to help build a place and tools to start a vegetable garden. Uganda lets those million South Sudanese, and it's up in the north, poor, ravaged by the Lord's Resistance Army, a tough area of Uganda. It gives those refugees the right to go to school in the schools poor as they are, to go to the health clinics poor as they are. The full rights except to vote. And when I talk to the Ugandan political leaders and say, why haven't you closed the border? Do you know what they say? Because we once were refugees under Idi Amin. Empathy. This sense of profound empathy. I fear if we ever have a totalitarian government in Australia and have to flee violence, who's going to take us? Empathy, I think, is a spiritual notion. We need to develop, to stretch it. That doesn't mean we can take everybody, but it certainly means that with empathy we will be looking for creative <coughs> solutions and building good institutions. And it's of course empathy that believes in cultural diversity. Identity is to be honoured. Aristotle said we always have to choose between reality and illusion. Changeless reality was always there to be accepted, but could only dawn on an unclouded mind. We have to deal with global problems, not the illusions that our nation can escape them. We have to develop empathy, find ways of emphasising our common humanity. Will it happen? Malcolm Gladwell, in his book, The Tipping Point, How Little Things Can Make a Big Difference, investigated how an idea or behaviour moves from the edges of society to broad acceptance 
Along the way, he says there's a tipping point that transforms a minority perception to the embrace of the majority. Well, our global sense of peace and justice for all, of solidarity, clearly has not reached the tipping point. It doesn't mean it can't. The universe is still full of magical things, patiently waiting for our wits to grow sharper. Holocaust survivor and writer Elie Wiesel said, I came to a conclusion that the peril threatening humankind today is indifference more than hatred. There are more people who are indifferent than there are people who hate. Hate is an action. Hate takes time. Hate takes energy. Hate even demands sacrifices. Indifference is just nothing. Indifference to hatred and injustice, however, encourages hatred, justifies hatred. To live meaningfully, to develop empathy, to be open to creative solutions, and boy, we need them, as the world at the moment seems bent on turning inwards, is at least not to be indifferent. It is to help enrich the lives of others, value their life, because that gives us meaning. Our welfare is bound up in their welfare. To finish with the words of Martin Luther King Jr., he said, we humans are tied together in a single garment of destiny. We must all learn to live together as brothers and sisters, all or we will perish together as fools. Thank you. But um, they, they were a, at least a consensus. The world of the UN said, we're not going to let Jeffrey Sachs do what he did last time with the MDGs. He wrote them on the back of an envelope and slipped them through <laughs> so quickly, and everyone signed up. So we got a whole lot more buy-in and complexity and a whole lot more goals, all the sustainable development goals. But they're still, for me, that, that gives me optimism. And it means we mark Australia's homework by those sustainable development goals, not just for the poor. 
Um, look, in Australia, uh, I do believe we will um, finally get to the point of accepting the Uluru Statement from the heart. I was devastated when it was so dismissively battered away. Uh, my radar says this will, this will happen. You know, it is outrageous when you think uh, we have said to Indigenous, when you can agree, when you get your act together, then we'll listen. When you tell us what you want, they went to Uluru and they agreed. Massive nationwide consultation and came, and then it was, no. Nah. No, that, that was really important. I still think the lack of re reconciliation is the profound wound in the Australian soul. Uh, why? Why? Captain Cook spending eight days in Botany Bay raising a flag counted for more than 60,000 years of Indigenous occupation here. So um, I think we will, we will get there on that. Um, Right at the moment though, yeah, as you heard in the speech, uh, it's pretty hard to, to be optimistic. There's, there's a lot of bad leaders out there, so. Um, when you get to meet with the new Minister of Immigration or Home Affairs or whatever title you're given, what will you be asking for? Yeah, I have a um, very strong conviction that turn back ugly and untransparent as it is, works. Last time I met with Peter Dutton, he basically admitted to me that boats are always, smugglers are always trying to get into Australia, not just people, but arms, drugs, everyone's always trying to get into Australia. And the ring of steel and the turn back, no untransparent, actually was working. That the connection that if we showed a moon's compassion to people on Nauru and World Vision with others have just let, uh, launched the Kids Off Nauru campaign this week. But whether we showed any compassion to people on Nauru or Manus, somehow all the boots would start up again. It's nonsense. It's complete nonsense. If, if that was the case, the fact that some are getting to go to America should have, should have started all the boats up again, right? At an ethical level, Take it any which way you like. Um, in my faith, those people who fled uh, made in the image of God and had been Take a manual account. Humans are always an end in themselves. They are never a means. To say your psychological in torture and indefinite detention is a means to us sending a message to vote smugglers, that's the end breaches in the universal law. It's just wrong. It's just profoundly wrong. I'd be saying that to whoever knew ministers. I think there'd be a whole lot of Australians who would say that. Uh, 
Of course, there's an immigration population debate about uh, whether we've got too many people here. I think it's more to do with uh, failed planning and social in and physical infrastructure than cities. When I'm in traffic congestion, I blame boat people and refugees uh, for the traffic. Uh, but if we have that debate and we see the immigration numbers overall reduced, uh, I can live with that if we increase the humanitarian intake. We have a very cherry-picking immigration policy, works brilliantly for us, take the brightest and best with business skills, build a nation. But we forget those people have been trained by poor countries who pay for their education, who no longer now are building their nation. Don't blame them for wanting to come here and build ours. But it's a bit unfair when we're so rich and we cherry pick their, often their brightest for our prosperity, not theirs. So um, I think the, the answer is um, our humanitarian intake at uh, fair share levels. Uh, clearly, as a, the only nation continent on earth with, uh, surrounded by sea, we have got very, very hung up with the mode of transport with how people get here. In the uh, UN Convention, it's not illegal to come by boat, but uh, it goes very deep in our psyche. Uh, part, of, this part of Europe stuck in the wrong part of the world. My, uh, my grandmother was Scottish, my grandfather English. When they opened the blinds when I was a kid and looked out the window, I knew from the look in their eyes, they just hoped they'd see out the window Edinburgh or London. Instead, it's Dili or Jakarta. Uh, coming to terms with the region we're in. Uh, uh, and then, you know, the mode of transport. Now, I don't want deaths at sea, absolutely, but who knows? The turn backs, what deaths at sea are occurring, we never hear about it also. I just uh, want to observe that uh, I have a charity for an international component, uh, Betis and Victoria operate, but to have my annual general meeting because of the number of applicants who have management roles in my committee, I have to have an invite from the The crisis in Africa of 6,500 people dying daily from preventable, 6,500 children dying daily from preventable diseases, etc. He commended the Howard government for a slight increase in aid and said it's not good enough and we have to do better. And then there's part of the cabinet that cut all aid to Africa <laughs> and uh, slashed uh, our aid over four years by 11 million. Um, and yeah, the visa restrictions um, is, is really troubling. We in Norway have the same problems with our staff. Mr. Costello, thank you so much for coming to speak to us. I feel immensely grateful for you to speak. Um, you mentioned the increasing sense of atomization in the community and the relationship with social media. And I was wondering how we can counteract that, what we can do, considering it's so all pervasive these days, what we can do. Is it a matter of signing off or can we you know, use it to maybe engender a sense of community? Yeah. yeah. There's no question that social media also forms communities. The question is, are they communities in a bubble that actually never has differences? Uh, I and my wife were just dining in little Chinatown, little Burke Street, at the table next to us was 10 people, all on their phones for 40 minutes. We had our meal. Mm. And I up and said, do you, you people know each other? Oh yeah, we're good friends. They did not say a word for 40 minutes. And there's something in me, maybe I'm a dinosaur still working with. You know, a, a meal is actually to engage and to download and emotionally check in. Now look, I don't, despite giving this speech, I'm the worst person to ask about social media. I know nothing about it. I've never been on Facebook. My wife runs my Twitter. Uh, why? Because I don't trust myself. I was actually, um, I was actually watching Q&A one night and I... My wife was sitting there and I screamed something at the TV. <laughs> you and I get you doing that. And um, suddenly I saw exactly what I'd screamed with my name come up. <laughs> and I jumped I thought, what's going on? My wife said, oh, I thought you wanted that. <laughs> uh, so look, that's your generation that really may have the answers to that. But it seems to me um, uh, 
detoxing from the ever presence, om om omnipresence of social media is pretty important. I, I when, when I first set up a Facebook and I have never used it since, I'll tell you why, I asked my three kids, they were young adults, to be my friends on Facebook. <laughs> and they all three refused me. <laughs> so that was it for me. <laughs> Settling war, the failure of the Security Council to settle war in Syria is appalling. That war could not have gone on for more than a year without the great powers, so Iran and Russia on the Saudi side, uh, us America, Saudi Arabia on the free Syrian rebel side, uh, funding money, funding weapons to them. It was always a stalemate. The illusion that our side could win now has 650,000 dead, 12 million displaced, many headed toward Europe, which has changed the geopolitics of Europe. Angela Merkel was magnificent initially, but boy, the cost to her now. And what Angela Merkel did was absolutely right. Read the first article of the German Constitution. It says, Germany exists to protect human dignity. <coughs> She actually acted constitutionally and legally, but a million coming in and the stories and the integration, well, this is the failure of international architecture, right? the right to protect settling a war of a, a country only our size that has had these ripple effects, devastating humanitarian crises and, and changing geopolitics. Tim, I think we could keep on going for a long time, but um, I'm, conscious, I'm conscious that it is uh, 5.30, so I think we will get a lot of questions to uh, hold there. This has been really <coughs> cool. It's been really mentioning, interesting mentioning the right to protect, because of course the second speaker, some of you will have been here, was Gareth Evans, who spoke on what is, at the time, current treatment, the mm. right to protect, which was, sadly, just before this, the, as the Syrian crisis was just starting, and he was wondering whether as he described with overreach in Libya, may have mm. removed the power of the right to protect them, and sadly that didn't prove to be the case. So, um, mm. anyway, look, it's been absolutely fabulous. Thank you. All put your hands together. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much, everyone here. Um, we've raised over fifteen hundred dollars today for the. Uh, for the cause, which is fantastic, and if people still want to empty their pockets, I'll be hanging around a bit longer uh, with my tin can. Uh, just like to say that I knew Renata really, really well. She and I were tech school teachers together. I was just a first year out tech school teacher, and she invited me home for a cup of soup, and I never stopped coming to Bobby and Renata, Renata's place. And when I look at, uh, at um, Marty and Larry, I see the best in both of them, Bobby and Renata. Um, but Renata would be really, really sad today with the rise of xenophobia and racism, not just in the world, but within her own Jewish community. And it's something which we all need to deeply reflect upon. Uh, and as Tim said, and he quoted, um, so, so well, if we, we sh mustn't be bystanders, we need to be upstanders. Renata was the epitome of an upstander. She stood up for anybody who needed to, to um, get a hand up. And uh, in her memory, I want to thank you all for coming today, to go out and take Tim's one drop of water <laughs> and fill the cup <coughs> to overflowing with not indifference. I think if there's an opposite of indifference, it's not difference. It's, it's generosity, it's empathy. Uh, and it's because
because of your dedication, people like you, like us, who keep the memories of people like Bobby and Renata alive uh, to help young people, in this case young Indigenous people, fulfil their dream as they were able to fulfil their dreams coming to this country from apartheid driven South Africa. Thank you very much. Coffee and biscuits next door. For those of you who want to donate, either look at David.